Hi, Kevin McDonald here and welcome to the Progressive Property Podcast. And in this week's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by a special guest, Martin Gain. Now, Martin is a chartered town planner and he's going to be sharing with us today all of the opportunities that are out there at the moment in in property, in commercial, commercial to residential, and how planning permissions and the changes around the planning law can massively help you in your property business. So there's been some big changes. But before we get started, remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any future videos. Hi, Martin, thanks for joining us. Hello, Kevin, thank you very much. So Delighted for, to be here. For anyone who doesn't know Martin Gain, um, where, do you, where are you based? And I guess planning, why did you get into the world of planning? Well, I'm based in London. Um, I kind of got into planning by accident. Um, I was always in property. I worked as an estate agent. Oh, wow, okay. And then I worked for a property developer. And in 2007, when the global financial crisis came, we hit some difficulties. So for a while, there was no property developing happening. And I thought, well, this crisis can't last for too long. A year or more, we'll be out of it. It'll be fine. So how do I kill some time? What will I do for a year? So I did a master's in town planning. Um, I'd always thought while working for with this developer, I thought that really the profit was in the planning. Right. Yeah. Because if you're a builder, you can make profit from developing because you have, you can manage your costs. You can go out and buy land with planning permission and build it out and make a standard 15, 20% profit. If you're not a builder, you're paying higher prices. You want a turnkey finish, you're paying a premium and your profit's gone. So I thought actually the money's in the planning because if you can buy a plot of land, maybe on an option, no money down, you can get planning permission, you can quadruple the value, you've invested very little, you can sell it on, you don't build anything. So I thought actually planning is where the profit is. So I did my uh, master's for a year and um, I kind of thought, well, once I've done a year, I'll be an expert. What more is there to know? I'm paying all this money. But of course, it turns out you don't learn that much at all. You learn the theory, but you don't learn the practice. Yeah. So I did my year as a planning consult, as a, sorry, as a planning in the planning masters. And then I thought, right, I still don't really know anything. But also this financial crisis is uh, continuing. <laughs> it hasn't stopped. So I thought, well, what will I do now? So I went and got a job as a planner in, in local council. And that's when I really learned about how planning works. And it's the real, it's the only way to Learn. get under the skin of the planning system because you're there deciding planning applications. You're seeing it from the inside. So uh, that's how I got into planning. And then I worked in councils for years. Um, actually, I kind of loved it. It's an interesting job. It's a fun job. It just gets a bit samey after a while. So I, I worked there for years. And then I thought, right, it's about time I moved on and I set up my own consultancy. So I did that about eight years ago and uh, just planning. And we've been running for about eight years. We specialize in planning troubleshooting. So I try to avoid doing just straightforward applications where you might want a consultant to give you some advice. I really specialize in cases where people have already applied and they've run into trouble. So it could be a refusal, uh, maybe enforcement, um, something like that. So I try and come in and, and solve mm. trickier problems. I guess the fact that you've worked in the council and now on the other side gives you kind of an insider, yes. extra knowledge of what they're looking for. Exactly. So that's really the secret. Um, the planning in theory is straightforward. It's all based on policies. They're printed, they're on the council's website, they're available for anyone to look at. So there's no mystery to it in principle. But in practice, of course, the way decisions are made is a bit opaque. And um, if you've worked on the inside and made those decisions, you know better how to, how to kind of influence case officers, what the tricks of the trade are, and how you get around certain little problems. Right. So um, you've set up your own practice, you, you, you're doing this for other people. Do you do it for yourself as well? Do you still do property yourself? Yeah, so I um, have, I mean, I've been obsessed with property since I was young. Um, and I became an estate agent in 2002, three, I think. And I bought my first place in 2004. And as you may remember from that era, it was um, kind of a golden time if you were starting mm. out as a landlord, because you could borrow. Uh, so my first, I got a 97% mortgage from Halifax, residential mortgage, on my little poultry salary as a, as, a, as a lettings negotiator in an estate agency. And I bought my first flat and I was on the move. Uh, and then the second one I bought was just downstairs. They were divorcing. So of course, as you know, once you're in the game, opportunities kind of come to you a bit more, yeah. disappear. And uh, they knocked on my door and said, look, I mean, I'd heard the smashed windows and the banging of pots. So I knew something was up downstairs. But um, they knocked on my door one day and said, look, you know, we know you, but you're an estate agent locally. Would you just buy it? So I did at a discount. And they just wanted 
to um, disappear. Then I bought my third and fourth on that same street. <laughs> so it was an era when it was easy to be a landlord and an investor. Um, I mean, I know you teach people to, um, to kind of specialize a bit in a certain area and a certain type of property. I think yeah. maybe I over-specialized yeah. <laughs> in that one street. One thing we do talk about a lot is gold mine area and yeah. ha- and investing in the area you know and yeah. a small patch. So, But that's a, that's that's a small very small, patch. Very small, that's very like small. one street. Yeah, I mean, I had yeah. the advantage I was a local estate agent, so I knew yeah. values inside out and I yeah. knew the letting side and everything. So, um, and it was then that I left to work with this property developer. Um, and he was doing kind of interesting things that he wasn't a planning specialist, he was, you know, but he was, he was, he was doing interesting things with planning to make money fairly easily and I, that I was kind of admiring. So he, uh, we first met because he came to me to buy, to invest, to buy. And um, I showed him a house uh, nearby that had been converted into two flats, but without planning permission yeah. or building rigs. So we had tried to sell it and we were naive estate agents and estate agents, as you know, don't always do their homework and know exactly what the situation is on the legalities and stuff. We, so we were selling it again and again to people who were, couldn't get a mortgage because it didn't have the paperwork in yep. place. And we, were, we didn't really know how to get around this, nor did the sellers. So this guy came along and he, I showed it to him and he said, well, you can apply for a certificate of lawfulness to establish that it's two flats for more than four years. It's called the four-year rule. Mm. well known in planning and I thought oh that sounds a good look we'll see and uh, so he he made a low ball offer because it was unsellable as it was unmortgageable he bought it cheap for cash he applied for his certificate he paid 375 pounds eight weeks later he had two lawful flats that he sold for I don't know a couple of hundred thousand pounds more than he bought so he'd he had to put up the cash to buy in that case but he could have done it on an option or something yeah so I kind of watched, I saw that kind of thing and thought, wow, that's really, is it that easy? And why had I not, you know, I mean, mm. I'd been trying to sell it all this time foolishly when it was unsellable in any other way. So I worked with him for a year, then the crash came and we both had to kind of retire from development for a while at least. Um, but I really wanted to pursue this idea of using planning permission to make money. So that's why I went into the Masters. And like one of the things I always teach people is, is exactly what you said about the monies in the planning is I always say very similar. It's, it's the risk is in the build, yeah. which is like because the planning is a little bit of money. Yeah. But you mentioned they're on option agreements. So um, just uh, obviously I use options a lot and no money down. But just for other people to hear from someone else, yeah. how would you use an, an option agreement to get a property and then apply for planning and... Yeah. create value without the need to buy it because yes. when I do it when I talk about it people go oh but yeah it's okay for you but yeah. to hear it from someone else from the planning <laughs> side that would be really good yeah well actually it's quite straightforward and I think it's one of those things that people hear about and are maybe slightly intimidated about and you know then shy away from but in fact especially if you just do it once it's mm-hmm. it's a piece of cake really mm-hmm. and um, the thing with planning of course is that if you find Say you go out and you find five garages in a row and you think, wow, I can put two semi-detached houses there. The problem is, even if they're cheap, 50 grand or 100 grand or whatever, if you buy those five garages and for whatever reason you don't get planning permission, you own a turkey. I mean, it's, yeah. you're, they're, they're, they're pointless. And even worse, at least garages you can use, it could be a tiny plot of land or something. Um, so the, you don't really want to buy without planning permission unless you're pretty sure you'll get mm. it. And there's no such thing as certainty in that. Or um, bigger developers spread their risk across several sites. So there are, but most people are starting out with one or, and they don't want to put all their eggs in that basket. So what you want to do is buy it subject to getting planning permission. Uh, and the most straightforward do- way of doing that is a legal agreement called an option agreement, which says that uh, the seller gives you the option to buy it uh, over a period of time, say the next year or year and a half, at a certain preset price, um, and uh, the seller is therefore restricted from selling it to anyone else or doing anything else with it for that year or 18 months. So you get your solicitor to draw up this agreement. Um, I used to carry one around that I had. I mean, once you have one, you can kind of use it. Uh, you get yourself and the seller to sign it, and uh, then you go and get planning permission. You have an option, not an obligation to buy. If you get the planning permission, you might decide maybe the market's turned, you can't afford it, you don't want it. You can sell the option on to someone else. Um, but if you get your planning permission, you want to go ahead, you can just buy it. Uh, you could exercise the option. Now, normally, the price in the option is at a premium to what it's worth, because mm. obviously, why, other, why else would the seller uh, enter into this? So if the row of five garages is worth 100000 on the open market, you might say to them, look, 
I'm not willing to buy it without planning permission. I'll pay you 120,000 in a year's time if I get, you know, I may exercise that option if I get planning permission. So that's how it works. And if you're somebody with very little cash to play with, uh, you may not even be able to afford these garages at 120 in a year's time. You can sell on the option. Yeah. And some people make their whole living, uh, clients of mine make their whole living buying and selling options. They drive around, they find houses with a big side garden or something, they knock on the door, they say, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, I'll buy your side garden for £100,000 in a year's time. They have nothing to lose, they continue yep. to live in the house. And then in a year's time, if this developer gets planning permission, <coughs> he sticks it at an auction mm -hmm. or he sells it through an estate agent or uh, whatever and earns 20,000 profit or 30,000 profit, mm -hmm. but has put almost nothing in. Now, I know for many people watching this, you'd be thinking, well, why would the owner not just do it themselves? But maybe they don't know how. They think, maybe some of you are listening to this, that planning was more difficult than maybe it is. Um, they don't have the money to do the application. They, don't have the, they just don't have the interest in doing it. So uh, is there those type of reasons, is there any other reasons you've come across as why an owner would not just go and do that planning application themselves and sell it on? There, I, it's, it is an interesting question. And I think that's... It's, it's, um, it's a false, it's, it's, it's a question from the perspective of people like us who would always do it ourselves. Yeah. That's the problem. We're not understanding people who aren't into property and mm. risk and, and so on. Um, I mean, I've met lots of sellers in these situations and they don't want the hassle and they, they don't, I mean, they've never hired an architect or a planner or submitted an application mm. or, and they don't, it's an open-ended thing. They don't know how much it'll cost. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and also, People who aren't investors by nature are risk averse, even when it comes to what I would cons what we might consider relatively small amounts of money. Yeah. So if you said to them, "You can make a hundred thousand from your garden, but you'll have to spend five thousand in architects' fees, and and there's a fifty-fifty chance, or whatever it is," they think, "Well, I'm not. I can't take a chance. I'll lose five thousand because they're not used to." Yeah. Uh, that's not and their world. For many world. people, five thousand pounds is a lot of money. A huge. They might not even have that in savings. Yeah, and if they're not in in this business, they don't trust that. Well, maybe it's only a 5% chance mm. of getting it and they're being misled by consultants like me or something. Yeah. So um, actually, there's other reasons. I mean, I've met sellers who are, so are nervous about annoying their neighbours and they think if it's all done by a developer, it's not them somehow um, and they just can't, you know, they've lived there for 20 years. They don't want to be the name on an application yeah. to develop in the garden because all the neighbours will be up yeah. in arms. Yeah, neighbours will hate them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's one of the considerations. Now, over the over since COVID, over the last sort of twelve to eighteen months, there's been a lot of changes in planning, yes. in um, laws, permitted development, etc. Um, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about some of the key changes that have happened? Yeah. And I guess what they're most interested in will be the opportunities that come out of those key changes. Yes. Well, um, th I think this is a golden era for small-scale property developers. And I think it's, there's never been a better time if you're somebody that invests in property, maybe has a portfolio, um, to step up into just the, the entry-level, easier property developments with maybe more profit. Um, and the reason for that is we have a housing crisis. The government are desperate to deliver new homes. They don't want to build in the countryside or the green belt. Um, they don't trust the big volume house builders who they think are land banking and so on. So they think that the best solution is to get um, small sites developed. So people building in their garden, shops being converted into homes, um, extra floors being added to buildings. So the government's approach for the last few years has been to expand what are called permitted development rights. So I think most people have probably heard of them and in, in connection with their home. You have per permitted development is, means you don't need planning permission. So you can extend your house without planning permission uh, in certain limited ways. And the government have decided, well, we want to get around the planning system. It's not delivering in new homes, so we'll use permitted development to create homes. So in August this year, yeah, very recently, um, they brought in what is called Class MA, and it's a permitted development right to convert um, town centre commercial premises into flats. Mm. So that is uh, shops, offices, um, certain types of clinics, creches, nurseries, all those kinds of things can be converted into flats and you don't need full planning permission. Mm. Now you so for anyone watching this and listening to this and you're watching it in five years time, August <laughs> this year is 2021. <laughs> all so right, yeah, yes. Keep going. <laughs> um, 
the um, and in five years' time, it will have been too late. Now is the time yeah, <laughs> to the grasp time. this opportunity. And the reason I say that is the very first permitted development right to create new homes was introduced in 2013. And at that time, I was a planning officer in Waltham Forest Council in East London. And no one knew what this meant, least of all the case officers. And uh, my boss said to me, I'm going to leave you handle this. Work out what, what it means. The first applications will be coming in soon. You deal with them all. and." like call the other councils, work out how we're dealing with these. So, um, and the first, I wasn't really, I mean, I didn't have the mindset I have now. I didn't see the opportunity. I just, yeah. I was doing my job. I was a, pu a technocrat and I was just doing my job. I didn't look out and think, wow, why am I not involved Deal in this? this? And I mean, it was, I was foolish. But it, developers started coming in. I was going out to their sites to help them, tell them how it worked and all of that. And one of the first applications that came in was a big, off empty, rundown 1970s concrete office building in uh, in the centre of Walthamstow, and um, I think the guy the application was converted into 23, 20 square meter flats or whatever. Back then there was no limited, there was no minimum size for the flats, no conditions on their quality or anything. And I looked at it and thought, wow, I didn't realise that you could do that. So he got, and I mean that that must have been a, a liability for him. This building it was empty, mm -hmm. nobody wanted it, so he got his. Uh, his his twenty three flats and was delighted. And I hope this is a bit of a revolution. But it took maybe five years for developers to catch up. Yeah, I was helping the developer I first worked with. I was helping him. I told him about it, and I was doing applications for him um, for two or three years before other people were finding. So the first one he did, he bought this little terraced office in Chesham in uh, in the home counties for three hundred thousand, and he got eight flats out of it, uh, worth about two fifty each. Well. Um, so, uh, because it was still being valued by estate agents as an empty office building that nobody wanted, and other developers hadn't yet clicked. Um, and I remember I was getting applications into the council where, where people were following the minimum flat sizes, which is a good thing in terms of quality of accommodation, but not a good thing in terms of maximizing the profit Space. at that time. And they just didn't know they didn't have to do that. They were, f they were kind of squeezing in 60 square meters flats when they could have done a bit smaller. Um, and then the office to resi thing, got overblown because people were just, they were buying sites with permission and then reapplying for ever smaller flats. And they did become rabbit hutches and a, and a problem. But back then people were just, so anyway, my point is a rather long way to make it, but you need to be in at the beginning on these things um, because once, it's not, they're not that complicated. And once all developers are on it, yeah. then you can't buy, you go to an auction and they're all, they're all, they're all on it. So anyway, at the moment you can take a, town centre unit, a shop or a clinic or something like that, and you can convert it into one or more flats or houses if it's a, that kind of building. And um, the, although it's permitted development, and you may be aware that if you're extending your house or whatever, you don't need any kind of application, with these you do need to apply for what's called prior approval. But there's a limited range of things that the council can consider, mm -hmm. things like parking, contamination, flooding. Um, they can't look at all of the other things. They can ask for affordable housing contributions, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I'm doing one myself as an example. So um, March last year, at the beginning of the pandemic, I found a lovely shop in um, Surbiton and um, I'm now converting it into a two bedroom house. It was a two story kind of coach house type thing in use as a shop. But it was a very straightforward application um, and uh, you know, a, a good way, a good, a good kind of development. Okay. Um, do you want? To, do you mind talking about the numbers? No, not at all. Yeah, cool. So, so in the numbers on that, did you buy it? Did you take it on option? What, what sort of purchase prices are they? And then, what's your end value? So that I, 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 I bought that for two hundred and sixty-seven thousand. Um, it went to sealed bids, but I think the competition was lower than it would have been because it was just the start of the pandemic. Yeah. So March, middle of March last year, people were thinking, I'm um, maybe not. The market's going to go. Yeah. yeah. So um, the refurbishment cost is about 150,000. Um, it's uh, the you know, costs of refurbishing in London are expensive and it's not my area. So I tend to just give a turnkey finish to a, to a builder um, rather than trying to manage it all myself. And the expected sale price is about 650. So that's 250, three, four, maybe a 250 profit. That's okay, so 250K profit from just one deal. Um, there's money to be made in, in, in planning games, yes. in commercial conversions. So Pause.
I've got something really exciting to tell you. If you want access to the latest information of what is working in the property industry right now, how you can start in property, how you can scale in property, what strategies you need to be using and which ones you should be avoiding, then in the description there's a link to a free report that you can download right now and access the information that you need to start your property investment journey. Right, now let's get back to the video. Because obviously lots of different planning gain. You could build a house in a field. Yeah. You can take a already existing property and get planning permission to convert, say, to residential. Yeah. Um, which do you prefer? Obviously the permitted development changes is all about existing. Yeah. It, why is existing so much better than new build or is it better than new build? So for anybody listening, what would be the key differences between the two if you're looking to get started in property? Well, um, I, I, I see it as a bit of a ladder, kind of a property ladder. Um, there, the, at the very bottom, you have refurb. And I know you teach mm. refurb, rent, refinance or, or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you have the basic refurb, but there's a step beyond that. If you buy, uh, I mean, I'm, I tend to think in terms of London because that's where I'm based, but if you buy a ground floor, one bedroom Victorian flat in London for 350 and you get planning permission, there's no permitted development rights for flats, you need planning permission for a little three meter square extension. You make that a second bedroom. You increase the value perhaps from 350 to 550 mm -hmm. and you spend, I don't know, 75,000 on the refurb. That's a, just one step beyond, it does need planning permission, but it's straightforward. Yeah. And it's lower risk because if for some reason you don't get it, you still have your flat, you know. So there's that. Um, so I do quite a few of those for clients. I have one at the moment in Hammersmith where they bought a top floor flat yeah. and they got planning permission for a mansard roof extension, like a dormer roof extension, which almost doubles the size of the flat and takes it from a one bed to a three bed. And I think they even, I can't remember what they paid for the one, I think maybe they bought it for 400 and they expect it to be worth about eight. So those kinds of things are a very good entry level in, um, entry, entry way into developing. Yep. Um, and then you, you continue a little bit from there. Um, there are, um, you, know, you can buy a house with a little bit of a side garden, extend the house, create a new home, build a detached house in the garden. Uh, and so there's that kind of thing. Uh, you can convert a house into two or more flats. Um, a, a, a typical model is to buy a house with a bit of land around it and maximize permitted development rights. Single story extension to the side, six meters to the back, loft conversion. Um, you can double the size of a house sometimes. That then becomes maybe a HMO or um, three or four flats. Yep. Uh, I have another project on the go at the moment, which is a house uh, which will be extended and converted into five units. Um, and you need, in London at least, you can't convert a house into two flats anymore. You don't have the, the margin three or four or five units delivers a margin. One of the things is, is we get a lot is people that come here learning about property and they live in London and they, they're looking at their, their own bank balance and going, I need to go north to do yeah. property deals because I can get a cheap house up north. Yeah. And one of the things I'm always saying to them is you could buy a 50 grand house up north, you spend five grand on a refurb and you make it worth 60 yeah. or 65. Yeah. But in London, you spend 20K, you can make 80. Yes. So the, there's so many opportunities and so much gold dust in this for people listening about if you live in an expensive area, you can make some big money in those expensive areas by doing things in a smarter way, yes. which is what this is all about. Yeah. Now, I'm just going back to the one bed flats, or a two bed flat to a three bed, or a one bed to a three bed, or a one bed to a two bed. You mentioned the need for planning permission. Yeah. What about the need for freeholder approval? Yes, you need freehold consent for extensions and you need freeholder consent for conversions. Mm. Um, so the way around that is extensions are less complicated. Um, I, and I might, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but my understanding is they can't really unreasonably refuse consent. Um, the, the secret there is to get the seller to get the consent during the conveyancing process. You have it when you mm. buy. Um, and there are little complications. None of this is easy. For example, the, the clients I'm working with who are doing the loft conversion in Mansard and Hammersmith, they have to put scaffolding into their na into the ground floor flats rear garden, yeah. and they needed their agreement for that. And if they if they, they had said no, um, I'm not sure how you would have put the pants out. Yeah. So, um, th but developing is all about risk, yeah. and you mitigate it as much as you can, and you kind of you build rapport, you build relationships. Mm -hmm. I think that particular developer agreed with the ground floor flat and the other freeholders. It's a share freeholder unit that they, they would as part of the development. They'd refurb the common areas. 
So, okay, you get the inconvenience of scaffolding in your garden, but you'll have a lovely repainted, recarpeted. Yeah. So it's, you know, these things, it's, it, you know, you build rapport and get yeah. around these problems. I suppose somebody who's getting some scaffolding in their little downstairs front porch, they could always get, say, I'll put it there if you give me a thousand pound or something Yeah, that, well. that, that wouldn't be unknown. Yeah, yeah. and to make... It's worth it. Yeah, at 400 grand flat, 800 grand, it's worth yeah. giving them five. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, so absolutely. For the inconvenience for a period of time. So, um, commercial to residential, obviously the building already exists. Commercial property at the moment with the pandemic, uh, prices are pretty yeah. poor, I guess, yeah. in terms of empty commercial buildings all the uh, around. The, do you see? You mentioned about the, the golden opportunity right now. Yeah. The permitted development changes have happened in March, in, in August. Sorry, yeah. August twenty one. Um, right now we're in October twenty one, so it's only a few weeks ahead. Yeah. Um, to take a property from commercial, the way they're priced in commercial compared to the way they're priced in residential, is that? Do you think that can? Is, is this like a short window? Is this a goal? Is this a big opportunity where commercial, once COVID gets back to normal? The commercial values will go back up again as more businesses start using them and stuff, or do you see? Possibly, yes. I mean, for the moment, commercial values, as you say, are lower. Um, and one th I monitor auction sites, the property auctions, and one thing I've noticed is a lot of stuff coming available. So it's not just the prices are lower, but there is stock. Yeah. Um, and the so, th so definitely now is the time. Um, Personally, I think commercial property is actually a bit of a, an opportunity anyway, because yields are around seven or eight percent in my area at least um, and there are some units that are let to an optician or something on a 20-year lease and yep. they're going to be there they've been there for 20 years they're going to be there for the next 20 years um, if they're paying rent of 20,000 a year and you can buy the unit for 30,000 or 25 sorry 300,000 or 250 at a somewhere between a seven percent yield and a ten percent yield um, in London, that's a fortune. I know outside of London, yeah. yields are a bit higher anyway, but in London, that's an exceptional yield and you don't have tenants leaving every year. You don't have maintenance problems. You don't have all that. Yeah. So number one, I'm, I'm a fan of commercial investment at the moment in general. Um, it's just not as easy as buy to let in terms of refinancing and all of that. But, yeah. but it's an interesting asset. Um, but it, there's also this kind of cream on top now that you may be able to turn it into a flat or two. Mm. Uh, so now is a good time. I think... It's not so much the prices will go up as units get occupied again and so on. I think it's when developers Start get more up. involved in, I think that will create premiums mm. and that will yeah. add a premium. So there's a lot of commercial property available for sale at the moment. As people start to snap them up, the stock will reduce, yeah. increase in the price. Exactly. Right. Um, and you have to be a little bit careful with commercial conversions because they can be a bit awkward. Um, a flat that's was once a shop isn't necessarily that the, the most desirable flat because mm. it has a shop window, it's on a main road, you might have a shop next door. It, sometimes they're long and narrow and not as bright as you'd like, maybe on a nice garden, whatever. So you, you, you need to be careful that the final product will be worth enough. The, the conversion is cheap and easy because you've got the structure and it's normally already insulated for fire to upstairs and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you, know, you might convert for 20, 30, 40, 50,000. But you just need to be sure, don't overestimate the value of the final yeah. product. For many people listening to this, they, they'll be finding it really interesting. They'll be thinking, well, how do I value it? So um, in commercial, you, rather than look, in residential, I value stuff just on bricks and mortar. You can yeah. check the house next door, you know the value. Yeah. Commercial buildings are all different sizes. Yeah. So are we looking at like pounds per square foot, pounds per square meter? Um, yeah. And then depending on the area. So how would you go about, say, valuing well, that building? Commercial, I, my understanding is that commercial property is valued mostly on the rent. So um, uh, they apply a yield. So if you, ha and, and it all depend the yield they apply depends on how solid the tenant and how long the lease and how, therefore how reliable. If you've got a good tenant on a long lease, uh, in, in, in London they might say, well, that, that asset should generate a 7% mm. return, we'll say. So therefore, if it's, the rent is 20,000, the unit's worth. 300. Yeah. That might not be precisely right, but roughly the yeah. right proportions. So that's how they work it out just as a as commercial, commercial unit in its own. If you're thinking of it as a development, of course you do it the other way around. You start with what the flat will be worth, mm. you take off your profit margin, you take off the cost of doing it and all of your legal costs and selling costs and all of that, and you're left with what's called the residual, which is the value of that unit, that plot of land to you as a developer. And if that's more or less, you know, if yeah. that, how that, that relates yeah. to the selling price. And so the you reverse engineer back to your offer price. Yeah, developers yeah. always value land like that. You start yeah. with what it's going to be worth when you're finished. Mm. 
take off a margin, which might be your 20% profit. Take off all of your costs and don't underestimate those as all sorts of miscellaneous costs and unexpected costs and finance costs and everything, and you're left with a number. Now, you don't necessarily offer that number. You might offer less than that number to enhance yeah. your profit, but that's the maximum you can afford to pay. Yeah. Um, with people looking at buildings, I know a lot of commercial buildings, people look at them and they look at the building, but there's one big opportunity that's happening recently is, is called air rights. Yes. So do you want to talk a little bit about <laughs> yes. air rights and the opportunity? I've forgotten about those. So yeah. the other big change this year in terms of permitted development is what we call upwards extensions. So um, going back to what I said earlier, the government won't let us build in the countryside or the green belt. We have to build more in town centres, in existing areas. And given that they're already pretty developed, we, the only way is up. So um, I don't know when this year uh, these new rights came in, but in 2021, new rights came in to add one or two extra floors on top of most buildings. Now, there's all sorts of opportunities from this. At the entry level, if you're a landlord who owns uh, buy-to-let houses and flats, you can add the floor to your... So the, there's, there's a, the most basic of the rights allows you to add one or two extra floors to a house. For, uh, and that's an extension to the house to be mm. used as part of the house. Uh, there's an interesting opportunity there for bungalows, for example, because you can make it into a lovely two-story house. Yep. Um, and it's, it's less rigorous than a normal planning process. You'll, you're more likely to get it than if you had to get planning permission. But you can also put these extra floors onto mixed-use blocks right. of flats, commercial offices, all of those. Um, and it's uh, creating, as you say, an interesting new market mm. because... Uh, suddenly when this came in, freeholders, there's, there are some companies and institutions that own freeholds and they looked at their portfolio and thought, oh wow, <laughs> we have <laughs> got more floors. <laughs> have, yes. So, um, and there's a lot of applications going in actually uh, and I'm doing quite a few of those um, and the opportunity is huge. So, I mean, one message I have for landlords who have portfolios is to look at them because often if you have 20 or 30 properties, uh, you know, and well done if you do, uh, there's probably hidden value in there you haven't identified yet. And I know this because I made that mistake. I had the first flat I ever bought with the 97% mortgage in 2004. It was about 2014, 10 years later, I was sitting on an EasyJet flight and there was this light bulb moment and I suddenly realized that I could put an extra flat in the loft space at an unusually large loft space. So I, I as a professional planner and a developer, had owned a flat for 10 years without seeing this opportunity. So we all own properties, we don't all own, but those of, if you have a portfolio of properties, it's likely that there's some hidden value there you haven't identified. A house you can add a floor to, yeah. a house you can build a house on the side, convert into flats, all of these things that we've discussed. Now, with, with a lot of people that might be sitting thinking, I've got a block of flats in London or Cambridge or somewhere I could do this on, um, planning is obviously one thing. Yeah. And then it, what about the structure of the building, being able to hold the, the load of another floor? Yeah. And most, most builders are obviously over, over designed. Yeah. Um, do you find that some of the buildings, it's fine on a planning point, but on an, a structural yes. side, they get turned down? Yes, so th this is a complicated part of it. Um, the planners aren't interested in that. So the yeah. planning is about the principle of whether, if it's possible, yeah. will it fit in with the area and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they will grant you permission and then not care whether or not you can build it. Um, the difficulty comes, I mean, it's quite tricky uh, if you bought air rights to a block of 10 flats, you're gonna have, and, and you get, and maybe it's already got permission, or you get permission for two floors on top. You're going, you're, I think you're gonna have a tricky time with the existing leaseholders, mm. because you're gonna come to these people who benefit not at all from this, and you're gonna say, I'm gonna put two floors I mean, God bless the people on the top floor, in fairness. It is, it is a challenging, mm. and there's, there's a well-known case in, just up the road from me in Ealing in West London, uh, of a building where they did these works, and the press have been reporting leaks coming in is mm. perhaps badly done or something so um and you know it would be very difficult to live in a top floor flat and have builders there for a year or two yeah. scaffolding all around the building putting a whole extra floor on top so you you'll have a difficult relationship with the existing leaseholders and uh, to your point about structure you will need a structural engineer to come and test the foundations and make sure the building can cope but i think in general as you say they're over engineered and you can get quite lightweight new yeah. floors they're kind of prefabbed or something mm. I think the, the point I was going to get to there just for the audience is when you listen to this thinking, is it possible? It's one thing is understanding it and then it's, it's thinking, how do I do it? But there's two opportunities that Martin touched on. One is 
option agreements. So you could take an option agreement on a block of flats and get the planning permission and sell it with the planning gain, so you're not actually taking the risk of that development and the problems with the leaks and everything else. Yeah. And the second one, I guess, is don't think about it as a block of flats that's full of people. Think about it as maybe an empty commercial building yeah. that you can take on, get planning permission for flats, yeah. but add a couple of floors to the top. So if there is leaks and stuff, there's no tenants until you're finished anyway. Yes, well, that's true. So, that's absolutely. Yeah. And it's a very good point that, um, you know, we don't all have capital at our disposal. Mm. And uh, even if you do, it's not always right. And we all think we don't have enough money available at any particular <laughs> time. So planning is a good way to do more with less. You can um, explore doing things with option agreements or um, th the great thing about looking at your in existing portfolio is you've no acquisition costs. Yeah. You can uh, look at a house, you, you might have a bungalow and you think, wait a minute, there's this new permitted development right to add flats on top of houses. So I, my bungalow has an unusually large footprint, as bungalows often do. I can put two flats on top. I already own the building. I'm not taking any risk. The planning application will cost me £500. The architect will cost me 3000 or something. Mm -hmm. I'll, take, I'll see what happens. And if you get that permission and you think, well, I'm not, I can't be bothered building that or I don't have the money, you can just sell it. Yeah. Uh, you're selling a bungalow with planning permission for two extra flats and you'll, that will be mm. a good return. Right. So for, for anyone listening to this, by the way, Progressive, we run a commercial to residential training, um, which Dan Eaton, one of the main trainers here, runs. I teach all about the lease option side of stuff. So combining those together, option agreements with commercial conversions makes stuff really powerful. But either way, you need a power team when you do that. You need people like your architect, your planner. Um, you need these people in your team. Now, planners, do you have like a preferred architect you'd go to? Or do you have like, do you, does it really matter? I mean, is there people that you go, oh, I'm so glad that's the architect. I work closely with them. <laughs> yes, I mean, the planner, um, the, what, what people don't always understand about planners is that we're not architects. We don't do design. Yeah. We don't understand uh, design. So, and this is what frustrates people when they apply for permission. Because you apply for a, an extension and the council planner says, we don't like it. And you say, well, what should it be like then? And they say, we don't know. <laughs> so go back to your architect, that's his job. So that's uh, the challenge. It's quite difficult as a planner actually in a council because you pick up uh, an application that plans, they think this is not right, I don't like it, it doesn't work. But you don't know how to change it because yes. you don't understand structure and, and form and materials and all yeah. of that. So, um, so as a planner in the private sector, who the architect is is huge because if they're not very good, you can't do anything with it. Yeah. Because I often get clients come to me and say, will you help me submit this application? Here are the plans my architect's done. And I look at it and think, that won't get approval, but I can't really, and I can tell you why in gener general terms, but I can't redesign it for you. Yeah. And I, su I suspect this architect can't either. And it'll, be a, it'll just be a painful process. Um, I, I don't tend to, re I mean, I have architects I can recommend. I te it tends to be the case that it, it comes to me with an architect already right. involved. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I would say, um, shooting my own business in the foot, is that you don't necessarily need a planner for entry level, uh, the more basic property developments. And, um, you know, the, the, the two most recent projects I did, I, I didn't actually do the planning for my own projects because the architect I use is so good knows the local planners, produces a design and access statement, submits the application, chases it up. He's a team of people who chase up. There was no need for me to get involved. And a good architect um, is at the very heart of a successful planning application, and they should know the planning. Mm. You know, it's not complicated. Yeah. It's not, if you have a thousand flats you're building, you'll need a lot of planners. But if you're building one house on a side plot, and your architect doesn't know the local policies for, for that area, for that house on that plot, you have a problem. Probably and the planner won't fix that. Yeah, yeah, you need another architect. And actually, this <laughs> is in my book, um, which gives yep. five tips on how to successfully get planning permission. Number one, the number one core tip is spend a lot of time and energy in finding the right architect. Because if you get that wrong, the rest of the journey is going to be very, very painful. Let's talk about your book. Yes. So he's written a book <laughs> called How to Get Planning Permission. So how to get planning permission. Is it available on Amazon? It is indeed, yeah. It's on Amazon. Um, worth a read. It makes planning exciting. It makes planning exciting. So um, yeah, what may, when did you write the book, I guess, and, yeah. and what made you decide to say, you know what, I'm going to write a book on planning? Well, it came out in July 2021, this year. Right. Um, it w it's been, I've been writing it for uh, a few years. I was blogging. Um, as you know, it, it helps promote your business and uh, I would write about successes we'd had at Appeal or certain planning issues that came up and um, 
so I ended up having a bit of a body of material and I thought it'd be great to put this together in a book. And I wrote it very, very slowly over years, often on holiday and stuff by the beach. <laughs> and um, then the uh, COVID came last year in March. And I thought, well, this is going to really kill my business for a while. And in reality, actually, planning went quiet for a month or two and then bounced mm -hmm. back. But for a month or two, I had nothing to do. Plus, I was, as, as we all were, I was at home all Isolating, day. Isolating, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I, need to, I don't like banana bread, so I need to do something else. So I wrote the book again from the beginning in about three months. Um, but I had loads of material to work from. So it's, it's really my COVID baby. It's, been, it's, been, um, it's yeah. what I have to show for COVID. <laughs> right. So get, get the book. Get it on Amazon, have a read. Um, big opportunities and planning at the moment, big, big opportunities. Where do you see the market going in the next sort of three to five years in, in, in London and maybe more UK wide? What, where do you see? It, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, that's, uh, pr prices seem to be booming, but we're not really experiencing that down in, in the Southeast. Um, but the market is still buoyant. I mean, what developers want is not a boom because yeah. of the uncertainty and the, all yeah. of that. What we want is, is, is high transaction volumes. We want stuff to sell quickly at a fair price once you put it on the market and to be available uh, at a fair price when you yeah. go buying. Uh, the, a nightmare for developers is a boom because you go to buy an interesting house yeah. to convert into flats and you've got 20 first time buyers after it and, and, mm. and, and they have, they, they'll go further because they fall in love with it yeah. and so on. So um, the, the boom hasn't hit in the Southeast yet really, but I think the, outlook for the market is very good. The one thing I hear, uh, people come to me for property advice, they know what I, what, I, what I used to do as a state agent and stuff, and they say to me, it's too late, I'd love to do what you did. I'd love to get into property, start buying buy to lets, but I'm 20 years too late. And they're wrong. I mean, yeah. they're absolutely yeah. wrong. I mean, it's easy for us to say this sitting here, having done it 20 years ago. Yeah. But I remember um, I became an estate agent at the, at the tender age of 23 in 2003. And I was sent to my first viewing as a lettings agent, and I met this family, and a family of five, and they were renting. <coughs> I was showing them the top end of our market at the time, a big five-bedroom detached house in Acton in West London. And I think it was on for about £3,000 a month. And um, I was showing them around, and I was in my first viewing. I was nervous, and I was trying to get to work out what was going on. And they were saying, well, what the reason we're renting this place is because we've just sold our house for 400000 around the corner, uh, because we're ex the market's going to crash, we're doomed. It's going to crash. Now that house at four hundred thousand is now worth one point three or one point four million. million. And I don't know what happened to that man and his family, but I really hope he bought soon after, maybe a year or two later. Mm. Because if he sold at four hundred thousand in two thousand three, uh, and didn't and stayed renting, uh, yeah. rents are way more than three thousand pounds for a five bedroom house, uh, three thousand pounds a month. So. That, that, that will always stay with me. Um, there's a famous headline from the Daily Mail in 1995, which was the technical low point of property prices. They were never lower. And the headline in the mail was, price is about to crash. Yeah. <laughs> and technically, they were about to go on the biggest upswing ever. So those two things I always remember and tell people. Um, the market has always been overvalued in, in technical terms. When I started in 2003, and I read the paper every day, it said, there too many times income, prices were overvalued, it's not sustainable. They've yeah. been unsustainable if that is true for 20 years. So there's risk, mm -hmm. um, but my view is that low interest rates are supporting the market, yeah. that there's all sorts of new opportunities, um, and that there's quite a long way to run before we run into trouble. Yeah, I always say that there's, there's literally people not born today that will become millionaires in property. Yes, And absolutely. you'll buy property in five years time off someone who hasn't even bought it yet. So yeah. like somebody will buy a property next month yeah. and they'll sell it to you in five years time. Yeah. And people say all the opportunities are gone, but there's people dying every day, there's people being born every day, there's people losing jobs every day, there's people yeah. getting divorced every day. There'll always be opportunity. Yeah. And yeah, there's so many stories over the last 20 odd years as well of people that have, have um, said that it's at the top of the market. Yeah. But today, house prices are higher than they've ever been. Yeah. And in 2030, they'll be higher than they've ever been. Yes. There might be a dip in the meantime somewhere, but yeah. they always finish ahead because yeah. inflation, um, it wages go up, rents go yeah. up, prices go up. And so demographics are changing mm. and we're not building enough houses yeah. as we constantly get told. So there's, there's a real underpinning of the market. Mm. Mark Homer, the co-founder of Progressive, what, one of the things I remember when I came here first 2013 was he said, Kevin, I felt like he said it to me, but he said to a whole room of people, but it was like, Kevin, <laughs> don't wait to buy property. Yeah. Buy property and wait. Ah, very good. That's yeah. very good. Very and good. it's always stuck with me. I think you need to get started. If mm. you know, if if you're someone who hasn't done this yet, um, you know, 
the first one is is terrifying and I remember uh, my first one that flat back in 2004 and um, uh, you know it the it, I bought it for a price that now seems ridiculously low but at the time I thought I was selling yep. a kidney you know and it was a huge amount of money it was terrifying the mortgage process the whole thing was terrifying but I'll never forget the day I went in the first day I went in and turned the key and walked in and that flat 10 years later was my first property development because Extended. serendipity I was able to extend and put another flat in the roof um, and so I mean the other thing is you need to be in it to win it yep. you can't I, I, I didn't look for a flat that one day I could extend into the roof that was accident yeah um, but had I never bought that flat mm -hmm. obviously I wouldn't have been able to so get his book learn about planning for anyone who's who's reading the book um, who's enjoyed the podcast how do they find you well, uh, uh, my website is martingain.com uh, and I am on uh, Instagram as Martin the Planner and Facebook and all other similar social right. medias. So Martin Gain, that's G-A-I-N-E, so Gain with an E at the end. So martingain.com. Yeah. And then Instagram. Twitter. Twitter. Facebook. Facebook as... Uh, uh, Martin Gain, Martin the Planner on Instagram, and Just Planning on Twitter. Right, so Instagram. Just Planning on, 20, on Twitter, twint, Just Planning on Twitter, <laughs> Martin the Planner on Instagram, yeah, and Just Martin, Martin Gain, Gain on, on Facebook. Facebook. So reach out to him, get in touch, wealth of knowledge, read the book, um, and thank you for coming in and sharing your My planning pleasure. experience and knowledge and journey and property with, with the audience. So if you've enjoyed this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you don't miss future videos. And also give us a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are around planning, around the opportunity in the marketplace right now. Look at the state of this place. That's disgusting. Ugh. Ugh. To many people, this house might look like an absolute disaster. But to a professional property investor, this property is a gold mine. If you want to learn how you can turn properties like this into profit, then join me at the Multiple Streams of Property Income event, the UK's flagship property investment education seminar, where you will learn how you can start or scale a property business. Doesn't matter if you're starting out in property, doesn't matter where you live in the country or how much funds you've got to get started. There is property strategies that will work for you and in your area. I can't wait to see you at the Multiple Streams of Property Income event. In the meantime, I'm gonna get a skip.